and uh, good morning to all. So on behalf of Network Finland and together with the Embassy of, uh, of Ireland in France, I'd like to welcome you all to this collaborative event, as Emer said, which will explore the new dynamics of franco irish trade relations. Brexit has created considerable challenges to trade and movement of goods for the countries of the EU. However, challenging times often generate great ingenuity and opportunity. The excellent relations with, between France and Ireland that we already enjoy have been enhanced and consolidated under the current circumstances. And it is not without a certain optimism and a large sense of confidence that Ireland looks on France as their nearest EU neighbors. The two-way trade relationship in goods and services between France and Ireland is worth 80 billion euros and growing. So it will be very interesting to hear today how the changes since Brexit will impact on trade, supply chain, and logistics. Our mission at Network Ireland is to foster trade between our two countries and support companies and businesses, professionals involved in the Franco-Irish business community. We hope that this inform uh, informational sorry, events and the speed networking opportunity that follows will be enlightening for all and help strengthen and build new synergies that will bring our business committees closer together. I will now pass over to our honorary president, the Ambassador of Ireland to France, Her Excellency Ambassador Patricia Brian. Patricia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Hello and welcome to everybody to our trade event. I'm delighted that we're joined by some of our key stakeholders from Ireland and France to discuss the trade relations between our two countries. Today marks six months since Brexit came into effect. This is, in our view, a very good point at which to take stock of developments in what's been an extremely busy and at times, as we all know, turbulent few months, which of course followed years of intense work on this issue here at the embassy. As you all know, the effects of Brexit have unfortunately been coupled with the impact of the global pandemic on travel and trade, and our world has changed significantly. Since January, either the embassy team or I, or both at times, have visited the ports of Calais, Dunkirk, Cherbourg, and the Eurotunnel to see firsthand the changes that have taken place and the new infrastructure provided to allow goods from Ireland to arrive smoothly into the single market. We've been focusing also on the opportunities which the change circumstances have provided. I'd like to acknowledge the excellent cooperation that we've had with our French partners, and I'm delighted to see many familiar faces on the panel today. And thank you so much for joining us. The Irish government has worked closely with France to ensure that as our nearest EU neighbor, as Richard has just said, which has been said many times over the last few months, that these strategic access routes via the land bridge and the direct maritime routes are functioning efficiently. The huge increase in direct links from 14 to over 40 now is a testament to the agility of the shipping and port sector and a sign of how important this maritime access to the single market is for Irish goods exported to France and for French exporters sending goods to Ireland. I look forward to hearing this morning from the insights of all our distinguished panel of guests drawn from academia, industry, and the ports. It'll be of great interest to hear their views on how the last six months have been and on what we can expect in terms of future trends in trade between Ireland and France. I hope both this webinar and the speed networking session immediately afterwards will be a useful contribution from us at the Embassy on the trade relations for our partners in Network Ireland, the Fran Franco-Irish business community. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Risha. Uh, my name is Laura Dagg, and I'm head of the economic section at the Embassy, and I'll be moderating this discussion this morning. I will briefly introduce our lineup of speakers, and we'll start as we want this to be as interactive as possible, and I look forward to receiving your questions through the chat function. To provide an overview from Ireland, I'm the Institute Economist, Professor John Fitzgerald of the ESMI and Trinity College Dublin, the President of the Irish Exporters Association, Simon McKeever, and CEO of Hannon Logistics, A. Hannon. The first half of our discussion will focus on Irish perspectives of Ireland's change since Brexit in January and what trends they see emerging in Franco Irish trade. 
We'll follow this with a sweep along the northern coast of France geographically, so no favoritism by the embassy. We'll start with the land bridge with John Keefe, uh, Director of Public Affairs at Getlink Eurotunnel, Benoit Rocher, Director General of the Port of Boulogne and Calais, and then on to the directory ports, Daniel Deschotte, Chief Commercial Officer of the Port of Dunkirk, and Philippe Dice, Director General of the Ports of Normandy, to hear the, from the French ports about what has changed and what they're planning in the future to accommodate changing patterns of trade. Uh, so John, uh, to start with you, uh, can you give us an overview of what the statistics tell us about the first month of Brexit for Ireland's exports and imports? We've seen a lot of interesting information from the Irish Maritime Development Office, the figures offer insights into the shifts taking place. We saw a surge in uh, row road traffic to the EU by 74% and a decline in GB Ireland traffic by 31%. So perhaps you could maybe decipher this for us and tell us in some way, what does it all mean and what can we expect in the future? All right, uh, I think the first thing to say is I am surprised at how seamless the transition has been. Um, you've seen dramatic changes in imports into Ireland, then a drop in recorded to imports from Britain of 40%. Now, that probably exaggerates things. For example, spaghetti coming from Italy to Ireland might have been held in a warehouse for Tesco in Birmingham and then sent to Ireland, and it might have been British spaghetti in the trade statistics. So <clears throat> they can be deceptive. But there's a big fall in imports into Ireland from Britain. There's been no effect on exports so far, but the British export controls come in in the autumn and the winter. And then we're going to see significant impact on exports. And um, the really big change has been in the logistics and the seamless transfer of logistics of a direct connection to France from connection uh, through land bridge has been really important that the fact that no trade has been disrupted and it has accommodated this. The one area where there is big change which has been done in preparation and where France may, I think, play an under-reported uh, role is uh, like the trade with France has not been affected, obviously, by, by um, Brexit so far. But that's because what we trade with France is pharmaceuticals. Like there's a big import of chemicals from Britain, big export. We're part of the, uh, the European supply chain for, pharma for pharmaceuticals, for vaccines and so on. Um, and aircraft, Ireland in, in, in imports a huge quantity of aircraft, which are then sent on through leasing. But the area where there has been a big in change is in the distribution sector in Ireland. We were part of the British Isles distribution sector until now. So a warehouse in Birmingham would supply all of Tesco's stores in Ireland. They've had to set up a separate, so Aldi and Lidl have built warehouses in Ireland and um, Marks and Spencers haven't and they have a problem. So how you get goods from uh, the rest of the world to supermarkets in Ireland is complicated. And we've set up a very uh, sophisticated distribution system, but it's more expensive than being part of a bigger market. And one of the areas which I think is interesting, whether we can become part of a French distribution system in certain areas. For example, if you buy a Nikon camera, it will be serviced and uh, the exclusive rights to until recently for the Brit Britain and were held by a British importer. And um, that's no longer feasible. So we need like distribution systems having uh, the larger, the better. Uh, so there are opportunities there um, where, and people tend to think about exports as being what's important. It's a rather mercantilist 18th century view bought into by President Trump that it's all about exports. But actually, the problems for Ireland are probably more on the import side. Um, now, the logistics have dealt with a lot of them um, and the seamless nature. But the future in distribution, um, uh, 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 for example, uh, we have a lot of uh, 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 British uh, retailers selling in Ireland and quite a number of them pulled out because of Brexit. We need replacements because we need competition. So that's not something that embassies like the Irish embassy in Paris normally say, come to Ireland and compete with Irish firms. But actually, that is going to be important. So, so far, it's been relatively seamless. So far, you cannot see an effect on trade, direct trade with France in the trade statistics, where you really see it is in the logistics. And the final thing I want to say is a really important development is the building of the electricity interconnector into France. That we are going to have an awful lot of wind energy, which we can't use when the wind blows. How do you get it out? 
Um, previously, one would have connected to Britain, but we don't know where Britain is going. And the electricity interconnector being built into France is the first, I think, of a number. So integrating our electricity system with the rest of the European system through France is going to be really important for the future in terms of tackling climate change. So there are these unusual things. When you think of trade, you don't think of electricity, but actually that could be very important for the future. So I think there are opportunities and changes here. Um, and so far, um, we've both handled it pretty well. Thanks. Thanks, John, for, for setting the scene there for us. Um, we'll hear from our, the rest of our panel, perhaps, on how seamless it really has been. But it's interesting that, that from the statistics side, that our, our exports have held up and that, uh, to France and that we're seeing these changing patterns by the direct routes. And yes, the interconnector is, is a major project, uh, our first link, direct link to the continent. So hopefully opening in 2026 from Cork to Morlaix in, in the Finisterre. Um, perhaps then to move on to, to Simon, can you maybe tell us about the exporters' experience? Has it been as, as seamless as, as John has, has said from, from the statistics, or what, what have you what have you learned in the last six months? Sorry, we'll just unmute. Uh, I'm there. Yeah. People have a habit of muting me because I talk too much. But anyway, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning, Ambassador, and good morning to all your all our guests this morning. And thank you very much for for inviting me this morning. Um, I think it's been a little less seamless than than John has um, has mentioned at the coalface for exporters because one of the big issues for exporters in Ireland is that most of them actually are also importers. Um, we we actually have very few raw materials other than the stuff that comes off the land in Ireland. So um, most of the things that get made in Ireland, uh, actually parts of them come in, uh, and therein lies the big opportunity I think in in trade between France and Ireland is the supply chain. So so really from from um, an international trade point of view, the problems really started to heat up um, as as the problems in Kent. Um, began in, in, in December, actually, we began to get a lot of help me queries, as I call them, coming in, um, particularly around routing at the very beginning, because a lot of Irish freight was jammed up and clogged up in, in those traffic jams. Um, the issue really for Irish, um, for Irish trade at the, at, at the start of January was on the import side into Ireland. Um, and, and even though, by and large, I think, and particularly for, for bigger companies, they were actually pretty well prepared for, for Brexit. As you went down into smaller companies, you know, in, in fact, they were less prepared than we had probably hoped. Um, but the biggest single issue that we saw um, on an operational point of view was just how unprepared British companies were. Um, and, um, and, and that was coming from the very, very top. So just a, a government hadn't a clue um, really in terms of no preparation done. And then if you think that in, in Ireland, and, and we do have an advantage because we're a small country, uh, but you know ourselves and organizations like ourselves and, and the government and all the different government departments have been working on Brexit since 2015 in terms of trying to figure out what we needed to do. And then in different working groups coming together to actually um, to help companies get ready, and and we um, have been have been one of the main customs training providers in Ireland uh, for the last three years, both to the government's uh, programs, but also on our own. And uh, so for the last three years, we have been training companies to get ready for the customs implications and a lot of the freight movement as well. I mean, that's really where 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 our you know we we represent the export industry, but it's it's really. I, I suppose in our DNA is how do you put a thing in a box and get it on and off the island. That's that's really where we're at. Um, so the initial problems were all around the the import side, to be honest. Um, and we had to redesign a lot of our basic customs courses at the start of the year to actually show companies what goes into what boxes on the various different forms. That's how how simple we had to get. But I, but I think a lot of work had been done. As I mentioned, that kind of lack of preparation in the UK really scuppered an awful lot of things. And you, and you heard about these trucks being stuck in warehouses in the UK, and John has mentioned the distribution centers. A lot of, a lot of the problems were there was that, you know, it, sitting behind a supply chain is a supply chain of information. And if the exporter um, doesn't know what is required from the um, customs people in the importing country, which they didn't in the UK, then that chain of information just gets lost. 
Uh, and, and that was a key part of it. And then also some, I don't really want to say teething issues, but I think just the overwhelming nature of people trying to grapple with, with, with what they had to do and getting the goods in. By the middle of February, most of those problems in terms of the, the health needs that we were getting had actually gone. So we, we, by the middle of February, towards the end of February, we were dealing with an awful lot less of those type of queries that, that we had originally. Uh, we had a lot of issues, uh, not issues, but you know, trying to help move some of that freight from the land bridge to the direct shipping routes, which have been you know, transformational, um, particularly when the, the routes opened to Dunkirk, it, it really set off a chain of events um, for other shipping routes to come in. Um, and um, you know, we're, we're seeing huge movement of freight away from the land bridge uh, to direct shipping routes. The next biggest issue that companies had was how do you get prepared for those, what was originally the 1st of April uh, animal health controls that were go going to be brought into the UK. Um, and, I, and again, we found that the, the UK was totally unprepared for that. Again, again, not knowing what to do. Um, we believe they've got their act together for the 1st of October. Um, and um, we believe that they probably will go ahead with those controls in October. Um, so it was trying to get companies ready for that and then they took that away. So um, I think Irish companies in general were, were reasonably well prepared. Um, uh, the issues that we saw with customs and that went, um, were, were, were largely, um, the big issues were gone by the, the, the middle of February, but there is still a lot of uh, teething issues coming there. The other issue, and I'm, I'm sure Aig will, um, will have a, a view on this as well, that, that we have seen is a bit of a disruption in the way that our freight moves on and off the island. Um, the nature of Irish freight moving on and off the li I island was, uh, particularly in Row Row, was that um, you'd have a, a mixed load. Um, there's a lot of very small businesses operating in that space. Uh, and the way that they make that business work is by being able to pick up a, a load in the UK en route to France um, and to pick up a load on the way back. Uh, and that started to break down then when, um, when we saw all the problems with the land bridge. We're still seeing companies testing the land bridge, so a lot, particularly with food and um, food companies, we still see them testing the land bridge every now and again. But from from what we see at the moment, the direct shipping routes are still more efficient at the moment, but companies will uh, continue to test them. It, in terms of the opportunity for Irish, French or French Irish uh, trade over the next while, I actually agree with what everything John was saying in terms of it, it is a, it is a two way relationship and it's very important. We, we have seen trucks coming in from Europe um, that we've never seen before. Um, so there's definitely an alteration in our, in our inbound supply chain going on. And I actually think that that's where the opportunity is for Irish French trade. It is the opportunity for French companies is to become um, a greater part of the supply chain uh, into Irish companies. And we are definitely and have definitely seen a movement away from sourcing goods out of the UK. It's just become a nightmare. For a lot of companies bigger companies have switched away from sourcing in the uk before uh, before christmas and smaller ones are increasingly um, uh, sourcing more items from from europe or further afield and that's that's where the opportunity is i think that's where the embassy could be very helpful in in terms of matchmaking in in relation to that what are the opportunities from big ops big businesses in ireland and small ones and how can we help fulfill that in a, in france and and further afield I might leave it at that for the moment, Laura, if that's okay, before I... Thanks, thanks, Simon. That's very interesting. And it, it, it is, this is, I think, is the core of, of our discussions here today, is the distribution and logistics and the shifts that are happening. I know we have a number of colleagues from Enterprise Ireland on the call who are trying to maximise these opportunities for Irish companies in France as, as, as French companies also realign supply chains. So it, it's interesting that this is a, really a two-way process and a win-win for both of our countries. Um, to just perhaps move on to A. Hannan, who's been at the cool face of this. A, I know your company is uh, specialised in short shelf life uh, logistics, particularly. So you are one of the companies uh, managing the bringing agri-food produce back and forth between Ireland and Ireland and France. Um, and you are using both the land bridge and the direct route. So we'd really be interested to hear your experiences of the last six months um, and, and where you're at. Have you been retesting the land bridge? Are you fully back on the land bridge? I know for agri-food short shelf life products, it's probably the quickest route to market. So uh, over to you, Abe. Thank you. Morning, uh, everyone. 
Ambassador and, and guests, um, thanks for having us on. A um, few things that has uh, been said already this morning, we have tried and tested. Um, the we're, we're using both Landbridge and the, the direct routes. We're finding, um, we, I can only speak from, from a, a Hannon perspective. Um, obviously, I can't speak from the industry, but uh, I'd be, we, we're, we're already using the Landbridge um, for our Holland and Belgium business. It's working seamlessly. We have our Dutch agent. We have set up our own in-house uh, customs team, which uh, took us 18 months pre-Brexit to, to put together. So um, a lot of training, a lot of time, and a lot of uh, expense put into the, the training. We have now uh, 24, 25 staff based in Belfast, only doing customs papers for our own uh, customers. We're not doing third party business, but um, we've had to employ 25 extra staff just to, to ensure that our customers are getting uh, the, the customs requirements 24 seven when they need them. We, we deal a lot in, in food, fruit, veg, flowers, plants, meat, poultry, that's all that's the only industry that, that we are in. So it's very important that we can keep the goods moving. Now we, we have a, a system in Holland where we have a cutoff time of six o'clock every evening for shipments. The goods are in Dublin the next night at six o'clock. They come across on the Lambridge. We're doing somewhere in the region of 250 trucks of small shipments every single week. So that's 50 trucks a day. We haven't had a single issue with the land bridge coming from Holland, Belgium, and Germany. On the other hand, uh, coming from France, we've had we have had a few trials, and we can't find the right customs agents in France who can open up our transits. They're too expensive. Um, we find the direct ferries are simple from a customs perspective, but you know, we can't, we can't um, use the direct ferries efficiently because they go, they don't sail at the same time. They don't go on a Monday. The, the Dunkirk ferry sails sometimes at eight o'clock, sometimes at 11 o'clock. So we, we have a distribution network uh, in, in Dublin, which relies on big lumps of freight hitting at a certain time. So all of a sudden, with what we're finding with the direct ferries is um, the, the goods are now hitting us at all times of the day and night, where with the Lambridge system, everything's coming off in Dublin port from Hollyhead at um, six o'clock in the evening. We're getting it at the same time. We can then group it and put it together. We, we used to have two departures a day to the whole of Ireland from Dublin. We now have four. So, um, you know, it's it's just completely, um, you know, going against our system. But, you know, there is some, there is some positive things on the direct route, you know, customs based, but really we're, we're doing it from other countries and we have no issues whatsoever. And uh, from France coming through Calais just is, proven to be impossible. You know, the other the other issue with the direct ferries is they won't be as reliable as the land bridge when the wind blows. So, you know, when we get a uh, bad weather, when then, you know, you could be talking about delays of 10, 12 hours, which practically is a day. And, um, you know, we, we have set up, we, we set up in Runges in Paris, a distribution center pre pre Brexit, because we definitely see an opportunity for Irish exporters and the French exporters to use us as an international hub. We have already signed up three or four of the biggest food service companies in Ireland are now using us um, as an international hub. They either get their goods from uh, Holland, Belgium, Germany, Scandinavia, brought to La Rotterdam depot 
and their French, Spanish and Italian goods are now coming into our um, French depot. We have um, six day departure. Um, we have six days departure from France every week. And, you know, we started this business up in almost a year ago. We haven't really promoted it. And we're already, you know, hitting 25, 30 trucks a week of small shipments coming in from France. We feel we're able to offer Irish exporters a daily service for small shipments, one, two, three pallets to from Ireland, anywhere in Ireland to anywhere in France every day. So that's that's why because of Brexit and because of the UK business going down, this is why we've set up a hub in France so that we can be a distribution network for the meat industry in Ireland and also for the food chain coming in to um, uh, Ireland. But uh, some of the guys there, John, I think had already touched on some of the big multiples that are looking at us. We, we're already been speaking to a lot of the big multiples who are going to be using our depot in France practically as an international hub. Now, if they have big shipments of full trucks, they don't need us because they can ship direct. But for their twos, their fours, and their sixes, you know, their small, smaller pallet counts, we can uh, we can accommodate them six days a week into us today, into Dublin tomorrow. But my my issue is we're doing 20, 30 trucks a week at the minute, which is fine. We're using the direct ferry for France because the land bridge isn't working for us. What happens when we're doing 200 trucks a week? There won't be the capacity on the direct ferries on a daily basis for us to, um, to be able to use the direct ferry. So we have to find a customs agent who can work with us on a, on a, you know, a daily basis making sure that we can get the, the land bridge to work. We, we need the option of the land bridge as well as the, the, the direct ferry, both for import and for export. Okay, thanks very much, A. It's very interesting to hear because your business is so time sensitive. You're talking about fresh products. I think you mentioned chickens and flowers. You can't get fresher than that. And, uh, it, you know, it's essential for the supply chains in Ireland that we do have both the direct land route option for these high high cost, time sensitive goods. I think we've two people on the call from Calais uh, who are experts in, 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 in what's happening in Calais. So it'd be interesting to hear from them to maybe they can respond to some of what you're saying of your experience of, of, of the land bridge. I have to say the embassy and the Irish government have worked very closely with the French authorities to make this as smooth as possible. We've been on the ground in both the tunnel and uh, in Calais, seeing the green lanes, etc. So a, a lot was done. Um, I, I hear what you're saying about the customs agents. I know there has been some inflation of prices. And I think speaking to you ahead of the call, you were comparing the prices between 12 euros in the Netherlands uh, to open a T2 and almost, I think, 200 in, 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 in Calais. So perhaps maybe just to, to move on to our colleagues in Calais who are friends in Calais who can maybe share some insights and maybe provide some clarity on some of these issues for us because it, it really is so strategic for Ireland to have a smooth functioning land bridge from France to increase our trade. So maybe John, to start with you. Thanks, Laura. Good, good morning to everybody. Um, I think this is really interesting what we've been, uh, been hearing from the experiences um, uh, from uh, the Irish side. Of course, we sit in the middle. Um, we're the direct connection Eurotunnel is the, the railway um, uh, that, that links France to the UK. Um, we've always seen ourselves as a key component of the land bridge and particularly, uh, as Abe was saying, for the uh, um, perishable side of the business because of the speed and frequency that the, um, the tunnel provides. Um, going back to where John Fitzgerald started, um, the, the preparation uh, that we saw um, amongst traders and particularly from the UK side um, was definitely insufficient. Um, I choose my words carefully, but the, um, the, the number of requests that we got and in fact still do get on a daily basis from traders, from transporters looking for help in how to manage the process of getting across the border um, it, it, it is quite shocking. 
The early stages of uh, 2021 were chaotic. A lot of people had um, stockpiled over the quarter leading up to Christmas um, and had in many cases decided already that they were going to stay out of the market for the first few weeks just to see how things would pan out. Um, the French closing the border uh, just before Christmas was a, a little bit of an additional shock to the system, that's for sure. Um, we were having to manage a, a, a crisis in Kent, trying to um, get trucks moving again through the, through the Channel Tunnel and through the, the other routes. Um, and then, of course, the fact that the, the agreement was only signed um, on Christmas Day, Christmas, Christmas Eve, with just one week to go before um, it went live left most of the industry searching for information, searching for um, clues as to how business could be done. And that panned out very much as expected during those first weeks of January. Lots of trucks turning up in, uh, in France unprepared with only part of the paperwork completed, um, not knowing that they needed a customs broker in, uh, in France to get the, the goods into the country not understanding that they had to have both an export and an import declaration, not really knowing what transit meant when you were just moving across the channel into France. And we certainly saw at that stage that the, the land bridge suffered a big hit, um, uh, and particularly on the perishable goods, the, the, the SPS side of things. People simply weren't prepared. There hadn't been enough information given to, uh, to traders. There hadn't been um, enough available, um, even for those who were, who were looking for it. So we saw a, a decline there. The, the, the dip in, in truck traffic was significant during those first few weeks of January. It remained quite significant through into February and only really started to um, pick up again from the end of that first quarter. And even today, um, overall truck volumes compared to normal years are still down. Um, I think we should mention at this point as well that there's, of course, there's another side to the business of, of crossing the channel. There's a passenger business too. Um, and that passenger business, not because of Brexit, but because of what followed Brexit with COVID, um, has been absolutely decimated. And so the, uh, we, we've all seen that Eurostar has uh, lost 95% of its traffic. Um, uh, we're suffering too um, because of the travel restrictions that are put on. Those travel restrictions apply to um, uh, truck drivers as well. They can only stay in the, in the UK for 48 hours before they have to join in with the, uh, the, the testing regimes. Um, and it makes making life much more complicated than it was before. But I think one of the, um, the messages that we get loud and clear um, is that the land bridge is the preferred route. Um, uh, with so much um, agricultural produce and so much um, that is perishable by nature, going in and out of Ireland, the, the efficiency of the land bridge had become um, a dependency, I would say, for, for that trade. And it's a, a constant request from uh, our hauliers who, who trade into and out of uh, Ireland that there is um, more work done by governments um, to try and improve it. And also more work done by the, the operators who, um, uh, who provide the, the, the staff and the finish of the, of the land bridge to simplify processes, to uh, connect processes so that anything coming across the Irish Sea or across the, the, the channel doesn't have to duplicate, uh, doesn't have to go through a, a, a two-phase customs clearance in, customs clearance out. And so I think the, the, the way that we're heading um, needs to be the, the, the dream that we, many of us have had for, for a number of years of, of the properly smart border. Um, the introduction of technology that will actually help that governments will use properly um, to identify uh, a consignment um, from its point of departure and to be able to trace that consignment all the way through to its point of delivery. And this, the, the technology we all know uh, exists, but it isn't tied together because there isn't coordination across borders. Um, but sealing goods um, in consignment, sealing goods in trucks, um, uh, using geolocation, um, uh, using um, a, a much more sophisticated um, computerized process for tracking the goods uh, from end to end, 
are the directions that everything is going. And so we are um, a huge advocates for the development of smart border technology, or as we say in, in, here in France, the, the Frontier Intelligent. Um, and, and this has to be something which is an industry-wide approach, because particularly on the, on the short straights, we have the, um, the, the huge flexibility that many hauliers uh, see as being one of the great advantages of the route. That even if you, you use Ada's a, a um, uh, reference to, to weather, um, there are alternative routes on the short straits when the weather is bad. There are alternative routes on the short straits when technology fails. Um, and, and that is what the, the, the trade has been established on. The, the longer sea routes are, are providing um, a resource at the moment. They're, they're certainly providing a, an opportunity to, to trade directly with France. Um, and that's undoubtedly welcomed by many people because at, at present, it wouldn't be possible to run full business um, using the land bridge. But many of the, the, the people we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis are, are telling us that it's simply not viable in the long term, both on a cost and a time basis. The, the, the downtime for the drivers, the downtime for the, for the trucks, the risk of missing a ferry um, and, and having to wait a long time. So frequency um, comes into this equation uh, as a very important part of it. Um, the, 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 the direction I think that we're pushing in now um, it is good on the, uh, let's say the UK export side to, uh, to the EU. I think the risk that we're facing um, uh, remains that the UK isn't ready for its import side. Um, and I would be slightly more concerned, I think, about what will happen in October and in January, um, particularly looking at the, the work going on in Kent with the inland border facilities. Um, very concerned that, in fact, the, uh, the, the preparation that, that is, is happening at the moment is still behind pace. Um, and both on the practical side of things, um, in terms of construction, um, uh, recruitment, training, um, developing the processes for imports coming into the UK, and then on, obviously onwards by the land bridge to, to Ireland. Um, I'm concerned about the, the processes being, being linked up. Um, the two very, very separate processes happening between um, uh, DEFRA and the, uh, the animal and plant side of the, the, the import and the HMRC custom side. Um, and I'm concerned that that won't be as efficient uh, going into the UK from France as it now is going out of France, uh, sorry, out of the UK and, and back into France. Um, and I'm very concerned that at, at this stage, the level of trader preparedness, their awareness, their knowledge of what will be required for the UK inbound controls is actually even lower than it was uh, in the build up to December last year in preparing for the EU inbound controls. And I think that's a significant issue that we have yet to confront. So I'll leave my uh, introduction there. Thanks, John. That's interesting um, that we, we've still got a lot a lot ahead of us uh, in October and January with those extra set of controls. Maybe just to clarify, can you say where, where is the traffic now on the on the tunnel or on, on, with GetLink? Are you back up to pre-Brexit levels or is it still below due to COVID? No, we're still below. Um, uh, we're measuring ourselves against the, uh, the, the last, if you like, normal year, which we consider to be 2018. Um, every year since then um, has had some impact of uh, either Brexit preparation. Uh, 2019 was, was disrupted by the, the two um, false starts, if you like, where there was huge stockpiling in the early part of the year leading up to March. And then there was further stockpiling leading up to, to October. Um, and then, of course, 2020, similarly um, disrupted by Brexit um, and additionally disrupted by, by COVID. So um, it, it we're measuring ourselves back to 2018, which was a, a very, very strong year, um, and we're not back to those yet, levels yet. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, Benoit, can we go to you in, in Calais, so for the short straights, uh, to hear from your, your perspective of, of how it's going now, and uh, maybe to respond to some of what we've heard from our, from our Irish guests. 
Okay, hello everyone. <clears throat> I've prepared a little um, presentation. So let me tell you if you can see it. Can you see it? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. So quite quickly. Um, so uh, maybe I just wanted to uh, come back to Calais port because there are lots of things that are moving in Calais. So um, first thing, um, Calais is, as you know, the first gateway to the British Isle. Uh, we've got three ferry operators, Piano, everybody knows Piano, DFDS, and since yesterday, Irish ferries, because they started their first commercial crossing yesterday on the Calais Dover route. So it means that we've got now 45 departures per day, one departure every 30 minutes. We've just been talking about frequency. Um, and uh, our Irish clients, they represent about, it was before Brexit, but about 4%. It's Brexit proof. Uh, before Brexit, we heard a lot of uh, rumors uh, and projections uh, considering the, the number of kilometers of queues that would definitely uh, and doubtlessly um, happen in Calais from the 1st of January. Well, it did not happen. It did not happen because uh, we worked a lot with the uh, officials, uh, with the French customs, with ferry operators, uh, with our uh, partners, Eurotunnel and the port of Dunkirk, uh, with the Minister of Agriculture. And uh, so John, John Keefe talked about the, the smart border, that is the, um, the, the system that was uh, uh, created from scratch uh, by uh, French officials, uh, administration. And you know, you've got this uh, color system, so the orange color and the green color. And uh, obviously, um, uh, Irish clients are sent to the green line. So the exit is as today. Uh, customs offices in CVEP uh, are, have been built in Calais and they are open 24 7. Uh, it's unique in France. Uh, so it just happens in Calais, uh, Eurotunnel, and Dunkirk. Um, even in Roissy, it's not open 24 20, uh, 7. So uh, that is very, very specific. Uh, and once again, the, the French administration took into account the uh, specificity of our traffic. Uh, we've got uh, customs agents, clerks uh, on site 24 7. And the Calais is a point of entry for horses and uh, also uh, one day chicks, uh, but not for cattle. Um, We've talked about process and procedures, so uh, it's quite uh, straightforward. I, I heard it was a nightmare, but it's theoretically, it, it's quite straightforward uh, to um, uh, transport goods uh, between uh, Ireland and, and the continent with a T2 transit document. So I heard that it was a lot more expensive in Calais, 200 euros. It's quite, uh, uh, it's, it's terrible to, uh, compared to the price that you, you've given in the uh, in the Netherlands. So please change your uh, customs agent, change uh, your uh, customs broker because uh, it, it's, it, it seems that it, it's a lot more expensive than the, the real price, the market price. And regarding agri-food, if there is no stop in the UK, so if it's a, a direct transit, theoretically there is no CVEP stop in Calais. So it's a green exit um, as before Brexit. And we worked a lot with the, the, the Embassy of Ireland uh, and with the European Commission to, to allow this kind of traffic. Uh, another specificity of Calais, so we've got uh, rail motorway connections. It's quite important because we, we'll talk in a few minutes about uh, uh, environment and, and the, the, the different uh, research programs um, to lower the, the uh, impact on the environment of our transport. So we've got two uh, railway operators. There's VIA, that is a, a subsidiary of uh, the, the French uh, historic um, operator, SNCF, uh, that has operates its own terminal uh, right in the port with the uh, motorways from uh, Spain, Italy, Burgundy, and other projects. And um, two weeks ago opened a, a, a railway terminal just outside the port um, that is run by Cargo Beamer, which is a German firm, um, and, and it has uh, uh, connections to Italy, Spain, Germany, and Eastern Europe. And, and that's uh, maybe the, the most important news, piece of news, uh, a new port will be open in Calais in 2021. Uh, I'll come back to this point a bit later. Uh, you've just talked with John uh, about traffic. 
So definitely COVID-19 uh, severely impacts our tourism traffic. It's, um, I wouldn't say uh, we don't have any tourists anymore, but it's very, very low. It's a, a, it's a 90% 90, 90 drop. So we are uh, definitely expecting um, uh, the, the, the opening of uh, borders, British border and the Irish border, because as you know today, someone who wants to come to, to the continent and then uh, has to uh, uh, self-isolate for several days, uh, when when they come back so it's not good at all for tourism so it's not um it's very directly linked to covid19 and we hope that vaccines and and the summer coming will be a lot better but at the moment it, the, the traffic is very low so uh, let's focus on the freight traffic so as uh, john keith 2020 is maybe not the best year to compare to but anyway i gave a few figures um regarding the comparison between the freight traffic in Calais in 2021 compared to 2020. So uh, as John said, there were a lot of uh, stockpiling at the end of 2020, where houses were full in, in the UK and in Ireland. So uh, the first, uh, the unit uh, on the horizontal axle is decayed, so 10 days. Um, so at the beginning of the year, uh, there was a very massive drop, uh, traffic almost half uh, during the first month. And um, quite quickly, the traffic came back. Uh, and uh, so at the end of uh, uh, decade number 17, so the 20th of June, uh, we have almost almost uh, reached the traffic we had in 2020. Okay, and, and the traffic today is higher, day after day, higher than 2020. So um, the traffic flows, it remains intense in Calais. And um, even if it, it remains intense, there is no queue at all. A few words about the new port. So that is the ex existing port. Uh, and uh, the picture shows the new port. So the existing port is the tiny basin you can see on the left hand side with the two ferries uh, moving. Um, and, and the new port is on the right with its wider basin and uh, a lot of more space uh, on the ground and the land uh, to uh, deal with all the different controls we have. Um, so we'll be able to uh, accommodate with bigger ferries, bigger vessels, uh, more vessels than today because we've got three new berths, um, and um, and uh, we'll have uh, also a, a wider basin for for bigger ferries. So that is the, the the big project at the moment, and it will open in October. Um, news in 2021 on top of this uh, this new port. And on top of the Brexit in, on the 1st of Jan, Irish ferries arrived yesterday. Uh, at the moment, they have one vessel. That means five departures per day, which does not correspond to, uh, I'd say, Calais standard, because there would be one departure every four and something hours. And um, the Irish ferry announced a second vessel uh, during Q3 2021. So um, that would make five more departures per day to Dover. Uh, we have developed unaccompanied traffic. Calais is known as an accompanied port, but we are developing unaccompanied traffic. Uh, at the moment, uh, the, the lines that will open, so DFDS announced a, a, a line to Sheerness in Kent. It will start on the 12th of July, 2021, so in a few days now. Uh, Blue Channel announced a few days ago um, a, a, a new line to Tilbury, uh, that should start in October 2021. So at the moment, it's uh, uh, directed to uh, the UK. Uh, but once you've got an accompanied terminal, an accompanied terminal, then you're able to go uh, everywhere, and maybe uh, you're able to go to Ireland. And obviously, an accompanied trailers will still be accepted on the Calais Dover route. So there is a big capacity um, to to deal with unaccompanied traffic. One a few words about. Uh, the different projects, uh, development on the uh, right side of the traffic. Um, so um, there should be a new line to set. Set is near Montpellier in the south of France, should open in the coming month. And we know that VR and uh, Cargo Beamer are uh, very hardly, uh, they are working, um, uh, intensively working to develop their network to uh, Eastern Europe and more specifically to Poland, um, what we hear from the market is that 
um, hauliers are very keen to put their trailers uh, on trains a lot more uh, than what they used to, 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 to do. So they are because uh, clients, uh, consumers, um, they want uh, proofs. Um, they want to, um, to be sure that uh, their products have a, a, a limited impact on, on the environment. So that's a pressure uh, that grows. And uh, last point, uh, not the smallest, but we'll open in the new port a duty-free shop uh, on top of uh, duty-frees that are already uh, in operations on the ferries at the moment. Uh, a little focus on uh, our Irish clients can be useful in this webinar. Um, ferry operators, they run services, also services in the Irish Sea, um, and they are able to propose combined ticket uh, packages. Uh, piano ferries, you know, they, they run the uh, Dublin Liverpool with three departures per day line, and Irish ferries, uh, they, they, well, they, their most important line is Dublin Holyhead with four departures per day and also Russell Pembroke, two departures per day. So they could be combined tickets and, and maybe interesting prices. So uh, as uh, John said, and I think he's totally right, uh, a direct route is a new product and it's, um, it, 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 it is a product that can be interesting for certain kinds of goods. Uh, today, there is no direct route from Calais. Well, work is in progress, I won't say more. Uh, but Landbridge is a product uh, that remains very interesting for hauliers. Uh, it's quicker, a lot quicker, it's cheaper, it's more reliable, it's more flexible, it's more efficient. Uh, and uh, therefore, um, um, th there is a good future for Landbridge. Uh, we need to be sure that the processes at the border are clearly understood by everyone, and that is uh, applied by the administration correctly as it is written in books and that prices remain reasonable. Uh, once again, 200 euros for a T2 seems quite, quite a high price. A few words about the environment. Um, so transport and, and, and maritime transport um, is part, uh, important part of this. Uh, it emits uh, important quantities of, of CO2. Um, so there are three main actors. You've got the port, the ferry operators and obviously our clients, the hauliers. Um, so first, regarding the port, Calais port, since 1619, uh, we, we have the ISO uh, 14001 certification on the, uh, all of our activities. Uh, and we've got an ambitious plan to reduce the impact on the, uh, on the environment of our activities, uh, reduce the, the quantity of CO2 that is emitted, reduce the quantity of water that is used, reduce the quantity of waste and so on. Uh, regarding uh, ferry operators, so the IMO, which is the international organization that rules the, this sector, um, uh, set uh, uh, an ambitious target. The aim is to have emissions, so the global emissions, we're not talking about efficiency, but the global emission of the sector between uh, 20, uh, 2008 and 2050. Uh, and um, to, to reach this, uh, this uh, target, um, ferry operators and uh, the, the whole industry is developing ferries of the future. Um, so there are short term um, options like LNG, uh, short term, why? Because it keeps emitting CO2 and, and they are working on long term uh, uh, options. So the FDS uh, will um, uh, put uh, on the Calais Dover route its new ferry, a new ferry that will be called Côte d'Opal. Uh, she will start in August 2021. Uh, it will still, she will still burn uh, diesel, but will be 25% more efficient. Uh, Piano Ferries is uh, constructing, so it's the picture you can see on the, the bottom right hand side, um, a, a new double ended ferries, and, and they will be, um, uh, they will have uh, big batteries inside, so they will be hybrid ferries. Blue Channel, so the new company that announced a new service to Tilbury uh, from October 2021, um, is developing uh, alternatives to 100% uh, uh, gas oil. So they develop sails on, uh, on their vessels and, and they also clean the exhaust gas. But research is in progress. Um, 
is a bit different from what we, we know uh, in the, uh, for example, uh, automotive industry. Uh, in this industry, the strategy is very clear. Uh, there will be no, uh, no uh, traditional engine by 2030, 35, and there will be a massive move to electricity. So the option uh, is already taken, the target is very clear, and the path is quite uh, straightforward. On the, uh, the maritime side of the traffic and the business, it's, uh, it's different because um, the strategy and the, the alternative is not set yet. So there are so many uh, research programs uh, that are carried out at the moment. Um, and they, 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 we know we can't use 100% uh, electricity vessel. That can't work. They are too big and, and they, they make too long distances. The Dover Strait is maybe uh, a, a part, but uh, they are working on other uh, uh, substitutes to, to petrol, uh, ammonia, methanol, hydrogen. So it looks like uh, the maritime industry is very late compared to other industries. And to be honest with you, it's true, but uh, research programs are, are popping everywhere and they are, very, they are going very, very quickly. Um, for example, uh, the port of Antwerp is developing and, and will uh, put in place in, in, in the coming months uh, a tug uh, that will burn methanol. There are uh, vessels that are uh, constructed and that, that are already ammonia ready. So it means that it is moving very, very quickly. Uh, people who are not in the business can't see it at the moment, but things are going very, very quickly. And last, uh, last part of the, of the, I'd say the problem, uh, environmental issues, our clients, um, they use vehicle. At the moment, they burn uh, gasoil and, and, uh, and uh, uh, petroleum, uh, lorries. Um, they, they are transferring very quickly gasoil to LNG. That's a transition. They are developing other uh, options, cars. As I said, the option has already been found. It's electricity. Um, and, and that's it. That's more or less what I wanted to say about Calais. Uh, as you know, we've got very ambitious programs to develop the port, to make life easier to our clients, and more specifically to our Irish clients. Um, we are uh, improving the service, the frequency. Um, we are attracting new clients, new lines. Um, and the aim is to, uh, to have clients happy, to have clients who uh, don't spend that much time at the port, and that get their green line so that they can exit as, as soon as they arrive at the port. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benoit. Hopefully we'll come back. I'd like to get some of the Irish perspectives on the unaccompanied tra traffic and the sustainability aspects because they are very important, uh, particularly for, for the land bridge route. So we might come back and get reactions from our Irish guests uh, shortly on that. I do, I can confirm that it was very smooth in January, the embassy had a crisis centre set up, but we ended up standing it down very quickly because things were, were, were very smooth at the borders. So it was a lot of hard work by the, the French uh, authorities and we much appreciate uh, all the work that was done together with you uh, to prepare for Brexit. Um, to maybe move eastward, uh, from east to west to Dunkirk, to Daniel. Um, from the port there. Can we maybe hear from you, Daniel? Um, it'd be very interesting. You're, 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 the Dunkirk line is a completely new line that was launched in, in January. Um, we didn't have that direct link uh, from Ireland Ross there to Dunkirk before. I think we'd be interested to hear maybe um, who are the clients uh, using this new direct link? What type of goods are being transported? And, and perhaps what are your plans for future development in Dunkirk? Okay, well, Good morning to everyone, and, and, and thank you very much, uh, the Ambassador, for, for organizing this uh, webinar, and, and, and Laura for doing all the logistics around this, this, this event, so thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to, to, to DFDS Island and, and DFDS, we, we indeed have a, a service between Dunkirk and Rosslau. I'll have a focus on, on that aspect a bit later, but, uh, but we, DFDS has been a, a, a strong support as, as much as the um, Irish shippers, uh, receivers, uh, hauliers, freight forwarders, who've been uh, convinced by the, um, th this service uh, almost straight away. But anyway, the, um, if I go back forward uh, a, a little and, and, and look behind me, 
um, we, um, we, we finally have three phases. We, we needed to all, I mean, Calais, the tunnel, Dunkirk needed to get prepared for Brexit. So that's uh, not completely behind us. Um, but uh, there was this first phase of getting prepared for Brexit. And, and, and then there's this uh, transition period. And I think we, 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 we right in the middle of the uh, transition period. And, and then we, we talk about the, the after and, and the business model specific for, for, for Dunkirk and what Dunkirk provides to the market and how we, we will manage to um, finally um, make of the Brexit uh, an opportunity in terms of transport for, for, for robo traffic, but not only, uh, low, low traffic as well and, and, and logistics. But anyway, um, yeah, so we ended, we ended 2020 um, with uh, an, an increase in traffic. Um, forget about passengers. We, we no longer have any passengers or many passengers on the service as everyone. But we, we managed to, to, to end 2020 on the um, direct service, uh, Dunkirk to Dover, with an increase of 4% in, in traffic. It was especially based on the... Um, on the, um, the October, November, December, which were very, very busy preparing for Brexit. Uh, no one knowing exactly where we were going. Many specialists were, were expecting chaos. Well, it, it's not exactly chaos. We, we, we all managed to, to, to do, the, do the task and do a job. And the, the beginning of the year has is, is, is slowed down, but still, I mean, end, end, of, uh, end of June, the traffic in between Dunkirk and Dover is is the same as the ones last year same 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 um, same period um irish service the irish service uh, we've we've now transported or dfds has transported between Roslo and dunkirk over 25 southern units and it's interesting because the split between unaccompanied traffic and accompanied traffic is 65 percent is accompanied traffic 35 percent for unaccompanied traffic but that's just just figures what I'd like to focus on is that finally Dunkirk is, is a port which is used to trading with uh, non-European countries. Uh, port of Dunkirk is an international port and, and Dunkirk is, is connected to Ireland through Vossler, of course, this is a, but also um, Dublin, uh, Cork and, and, and Organisch on the, on the west coast. I'm sorry for the pronunciation, but uh, this is a port that where uh, Dunkirk uh, trades with from for, 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 for bulk for big bulk and and, and, and liquid bulk and um, but but uh, what's interesting is during this preparation of Brexit so we had services which were launched from Dunkirk to um, Irish ports for containers containers swap bodies tank containers providing both transshipment from uh, other countries uh, to um, third parties to to Ireland through Dunkirk, but also uh, pr um, providing um, some opportunities for shippers and hauliers wishing to use um, swap bodies for domestic cargo from all over Europe in, into into Ireland uh, through Dunkirk. This is not Roslau. This is for Dublin and and, and Cork. Um, so it's a change in the model that we've been. Um, uh, follow, seeing uh, over the last few years. So the, 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 the main idea is, is a combination, for Dunkirk at least, a combination of the land bridge and, and the land bridge. And, and we, we know, I mean, business is not completely secured. We, we had some, some interesting comments from, 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 um, from some, some, Irish, um, uh, some Irish shippers and, and, and receivers. Uh, there's still many adjustments which need to be done. There are many adjustments which need to be done with the French customs, um, border inspection posts, um, and then with the next, um, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the arrival of the controls in the, in the UK. So the 2021 will be very interesting. And, and this is why we've managed to combine land bridge. So that's really Rovo traffic urgent, uh, some dedicated for, for some kinds of cargo in combination with a service which was launched 2nd of January by DFDS, which is a Volvo service, direct service between Roslo and, and Dunkirk. And, and on that service, DFDS also needed to do some adjustments. And, and, and at the moment, they've probably found the right adjustment, at least for the summer, 
and then we see what happened. I mean, where the, will, will, will passengers be back on, on the service and will the passengers be able to connect between, um, or use the service between Roswell and Dunkirk? Um, but these adjustments will be, would be achieved in 2021, we believe. In 2022, we will be extending the Irish terminal because this is the, this is the, the name we've given to the terminal, the, and this will be officially launched in, in, in September or October, and we will be doubling the capacity of the, of, of the terminal. And, and this will be this new terminal or the extension of the terminal will be delivered to the FDS by uh, 1st of January 2022 in order to be able to, to, to prepare and, and, and further elaborate and progress on this, uh, on this direct service. Um, low, low um, uh, traffic, so that's containers, swap bodies, uh, transshipped in Dunkirk. We finally um, managed to serve Ireland quicker than transboarding uh, containers in, in the main UK ports. We, we've been we working with the big shipping lines, the, the, the number one shipping lines, and uh, the container shipping lines. And we, we finally have come to the conclusion that uh, Dunkirk can be a solution compared with um, London Gateway, uh, Southampton, Felixstowe for transshipping cargo, which is destined to Ireland through Dunkirk. Dunkirk being finally a, 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 another British port in order to, 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 to be able to logistically serve um, Ireland. And, and on top of this, and, and this is also part of the business model of, of Dunkirk, is in, in parallel, we are developing uh, logistics, huge logistics, huge logistics, that's warehousing. We've got 150 hectares, which is dedicated to the development of logistics and which will support the, um, the, the progress and the proposals and the service to uh, shippers, receivers, uh, hauliers, who will be able to use these warehouses to um, serve the, uh, the the Irish market? Um, we are all facing the same same issue. There are there's a lack of drivers. It's 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 more and more difficult for hauliers to find some drivers. We we can't um, support uh, long stops for, for for documentation control and customs control or border inspection post control. And so we will have some cargo landing in Dunkirk, prepared in Dunkirk and, and, and ready to, to be delivered to Ireland and vice versa. So Dunkirk wants not only to be a, 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 another international or trading British port, we, we, we are a, a strong partner of Ireland and, and we, we, we've noticed, I mean, for the last few months that we are really strengthening the, the links between Ireland and, and France through the, the, the French ports and, 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 and tunnel, the Euro tunnel, Ketlink, uh, Calais, uh, Dunkirk, Cherbourg uh, are, are, are part of the players. Um, we, um, we, we really insist on the adjustments. It, it's, been, it's been, we had short notice, even if we had four, four years to prepare this, uh, the, the, this issue, but some few, few days before the, 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 the final date, we were still doing some, 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 clean, some, some adjustments. Sanitary, so the sanitary crisis is, is, not, is not helping us. And, and, and this is very interesting. I mean, this, this whole service between Dunkirk and Rossola, the way it was, it was built, thought, um, negotiated, uh, was done at distance with, with all of our partners. And we, we finally even signed the contract at distance. And we, we, we can't wait seeing all our partners and, and be a, able to, to celebrate the, the, the opening of this line. Uh, there'll be more to come. I mean, um, um, it, it is it is not a a competition between land bridge or direct service. It's it's finally a mix of of what every port in France, with its specificities and 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 in, and in partnership, the one with the other, will be able to provide to the market. Uh, Dunkirk. It it will clearly be a mix of direct service. It will be of of road, road traffic, of land bridge and short distance, of low low service. Um, on a component service and uh, and and logistics, logistics, sorry, which will be associated to to the success of uh, trading between French ports and and an island. This is what I wanted to say in a few words. So we 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 I'm think I mean in in the, in the middle of the gap and um, and and 
and we see what the model will be. I don't think we, none of us knows exactly what the model will be for, for 2023, 2024, but at least there's a, there's a lot to do because we want to keep this business inside, inside France. We, we don't want to see this business going to our northern ports neighborhoods who's, I mean, who's, who, who have the, uh, the, the advantage of, of trading uh, for, for being trading for centuries and and these are the ones we are competing with on the, on the day-to-day business at least in the international trade and I think that so the, the trade between Ireland and France will be also part of the uh, the market every other ports will want to 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 fight to fight and, and 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 get back so we insist I mean we're working together in order to facilitate um, the um, the uh, transportation to to all of our ports and and working closely with the uh, Customs and Ministry of Agriculture. If and it's 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 um it's our task. I mean, if if there are any issues, shippers, receivers, hauliers, freight forwarders, or or representatives of the states uh, know about, it is important that we we get the information and we we can we can work together to make this um, th- this link exist for for a very long time. So this uh, these are the few words I wanted to say on my on my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for giving that overview of the different, the diversity of activity in Dunkirk, as you say, it's a deep sea port with that capacity to distribute to Ireland directly from other around the world, uh, avoiding maybe the UK, as you're saying. That's one of the other shifts in distribution that you're noticing and the low, low, row, low, row, row aspects. So there's so much happening in Dunkirk. It was one of the surprises, I think, of Brexit was when uh, that line opened up just in time as we were uh, experiencing the shock of COVID and Brexit at, at the same time. So it shows the strategic importance of the direct routes for Ireland. Um, and I think you make a very good point about competition with the northern ports being, I suppose, it's healthy for Ireland in that we have more opportunities, but also it, it, it's, it's pressure on the French ports, but each port has its specificity. It's hinterland with Dunkirk maybe serving Germany and the Netherlands. And then let's hear from Philippe about Cherbourg and, and what it offers to the Irish market. I think it's the probably at this stage the most Irish of the ports. Um, but if, if Philippe is there to, to present Cherbourg and then hopefully we'll get a final round of questions. I know we're, we're tight on time. So um, Philippe, over to you in Cherbourg. Thank you very much, your Excellence, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Port of Normandy the, is the owner of the port of uh, Caen, with Ram, Dieppe, and, and Cherbourg. I will share the, the, the presentation. So we we have the, the, the cross-channel activities at the heart of our business, with um, links to the ports of New Haven, Portsmouth, Poole. Dublin and Rosler with four reliable and well-known shipping companies, Brittany Ferries, Line, Irish Ferries, and DFDS on six different routes, which are which are on the map. Um, and in our three ports, we have up to eight, 10 departures a day for 2 million passengers per year and 200,000 trailers per, per year. Uh, except COVID years, of course. So uh, a focus on uh, a focus on what has been done to to cope with Brexit on our three ports, um, an enormous investment, uh, 10 million euros up to now, and 20 more to come to 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 have nearer BCP BCP on the, on the ports of uh, Dieppe and Cambridgeshire. Our ports are Brexit ready, of course, and since uh, since March of, of the 2019, the, 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 the roads, the infrastructure that have been reorganized, we have connected all our ports to the, the, the French custom IT system, SE Brexit, which has been um, talked about before. And BCP are opened in all our ports, of course, with the widest national vet and phytosanitary approvals, a range of approval in our ports because uh, since there are not only horses but all the, all the range of, of living uh, animals authorized in France is on our, uh, on our port. So uh, focus on the port of Cherbourg which has uh, um, the main difficulty, the main complexity of the port of Cherbourg is that we are 
the, a, a UK port and an Irish port, and we have to maintain fluidity and particularly for our um, Irish customers, which can directly um, go out of the of the of the ferries on the green lines. The, the, the three link spans on the port of Cherbourg are, are directly connected to the BCP, to the border control post in, in Orange. And the, 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 green, the green lorries and the, especially the Irish ones are uh, able to, 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 to go directly to the exit without being in the traffic jam of the, of the control to pass if jam there is, which is not the case up to now. Our activity has, has, has grown enormously since the since 2004. You have 2005. You have the, the you have this on the on the slide, but especially in 2021, a strong traffic increase, three times uh, what has been done up to now. And our best our best year was 2019, and we are. It was uh, 30, 35,000 lorries from and to Irish um, in the port of Cherbourg. At the end of May, we were at 45,000 uh, 45, lorries on the port of Cherbourg. It is a, a, an, enormous, an enormous increase, 9,000 trailers per month, and it is a constant it has been regular since January, the, the 9,000 9, trailers per month since the beginning of the year each month. Why, why this growth demand and offer, I will say, in Irish population growth and BPI and so on, G GDP, but well, we have talked about this, the land bridge issue, but not only we have on the, 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 the offer side, Three uh, companies, Irish Ferries, Ten Line, Brittany Ferries, two routes, Rossler and Dublin, two companies per route. Uh, I heard um, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald saying we need competition. We have and you have competition in the port of Cherbourg. Um, two ports, uh, Rossler and Dublin, two, co two companies per route uh, to, with, uh, with three companies, globally speaking up to three departures a day and 10 calls a week with high capacity ferries, with high capacity ferries, sorry, and, and new new ship on the on the route this year, the, the MV Fortailer, Esprit Connemara. And the, 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 this offer is as regular, as stable, and we think that that it uh, that it's for a for a for a long time up to now. And according to the need, you can have else row packs or rural ferries. Training spans must be dedicated to one route, to one company, to one destination, but um, available as, uh, as needed. Ability to welcome the latest generations of ferries, which has been the case with the, with the, with the guests, with the, the Irish ferry uh, guests, necessarily. Uh, ability to process more and accompany trailers, which has uh, we have doubled the, non, the, the, the the amount of an accompanied trailers from and to uh, Ireland this year. Um, flexibility, reliability, and which is less known, perhaps. And, and I won't be I won't be in, well. I have my friends and colleagues around the table, Benoit, Daniel, but. Uh, our Irish customers don't uh, won't forget that we are directly linked to motorway and to go to to go to Brussels, including re regulatory breaks for the lorries. That is um, 30, 30 hours. Uh, so the, the the full transit time from Irish port to Brussels via Cherbourg is not to be to be forgotten and not to be. Um, over um, well, over over skiing. That's that's good. That's a good transit time. Uh, you don't have to to travel to Paris to go to, to to Brussels or to Germany. Several wide roads and one of the shortest routes from Ireland to 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 the continent. The wide interland we we have um, we have seen on the map west of France and Spain. That is our core business, but also Paris area 
and the east of France and the globally speaking west west uh, western Europe. Um, many agricultural and food processing industry products, made, but not only, and um, many manufactured products and especially chemicals and pharmaceuticals from Ireland and a balance import export traffic. So you will, uh, you won't have problems to go back, uh, to go back with your, uh, with your uh, freight. The, 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 the capacity to cope with logistics has not yet been, been said, but warehouse capacity on the port is important, 10,000 10, square meters, cross docking, long storage possibility, and uh, a new area, a new business area under development, only two kilometers from the bus. You have the, you have the bus, well, you, you don't see them, they're on the, on the, on the bottom of the, of the slide and to support logistic needs, which is a, a, a real, uh, real need, um, considering the increase of, of Irish traffic, of Irish activity, we are on developing a new business area dedicated to, to logistics. What are the ongoing projects? Shore power, development of terminals to optimize control logistics. We have to, we have all of, over all of us to cope with EES and three exit system in May 2022 and to increase our trailage storage capacity. We, in, we have many investments in port tanks, important investments, sorry, in port tanks and, and modernization of the link spans to face the increasing activity. And we are working with the IMDO and Port of Dublin to, uh, we are partners with, with IMDO and Port of Dublin to improve digitalization, dematerialization of the, of the activity, less paper, more services, to propose a set of, of interoperable digital tools to improve the, to improve the routes and the, 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 the logistics of, uh, of the, the, the paperwork of the, of the activity. And last but not least, uh, the railroad terminal from from Bayonne, well, from the to 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 to, to capture the, the the Spanish and, and Portuguese activity uh, southwest of France from Bayonne to Cherbourg, uh, which will be uh, which will be operated by uh, Brittany Ferries, but open to all customers uh, according to Brittany in two. 2023. And in final, final, final hint at, at our at the, the, the what we want to do and, and the partnership we have in mind. The, the Saint Patrick Day is each year celebrated in the port of Cherbourg, and you are welcome. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Philippe. Indeed, St. Patrick's Day was a, we had a green north of France all the way from Calais to Cherbourg. So thanks to everyone for that. If I can, for just a final round, if we've enough time, we'll try and do this to go back to all of our Irish participants to get reactions from them. And um, perhaps maybe to start with Simon, just some of the trends that we're hearing there about an increase in unaccompanied traffic, greater interest in sustainability logistics offering in France, all the ports have done, you know, have made, have significant infrastructure investment made. Um, how, how do you, how do you see Irish exporters maybe, what's their interest in this offering from France? I did it again, I did it again, didn't I? Um, uh, so, so my, my view is that I, I think we're seeing a more permanent shift in, um, in traffic away from the land bridge to the um, to the direct shipping routes, um, and that was largely driven by most, sorry, not most, but a lot of the larger, particularly American-owned businesses based in Ireland, um, and they took that decision last year, um, and they're not in any hurry to 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 um, to change their mind. Um, and you know, just listening to what John was saying, um, you know, in terms of how how you feel the prep is going for the for the the animal controls. Um, you know, it's it's a very interesting. Um, you know, I, I think I think the I, I think we're seeing a permanent shift away from the UK, 
um, talking to people I know over there, you know, very, very early on in the year, you know, people were saying to me that the distribution model whereby the UK was a distribution centre for both Ireland, England and parts of Northwestern Europe is finished, it's over, it's gone. So I think there is an opportunity for um, certainly Northwestern France to become a distribution hub for um, uh, Ireland and certainly parts of the UK perhaps as well. There's also an opportunity for South Southeastern Ireland to take a to take a part in that as well and to become a distribution hub. Um, so I, I think we're seeing a permanent shift away from it, um, and I and I think that that would be driven by larger business. And and I do think it is a um, I do think it does present challenges for the logistics industry uh, because companies over time are going to want to have a more secured supply chain, um, and that security is probably more likely to come from continental Europe and wider afield than it is through the UK. That was one thing. I was, I was also interested in, in, in just seeing the scale of investment that's going into the, into the French ports, which is massively impressive. It would be remiss of me not to mention to Benoit, of course, the, the issue that we are having with lifting transit bonds. Um, and um, I don't know, Benoit, maybe if you have a comment on, on that one, but you know, the and, and it is an issue that is complicating the um, the land bridge for um, for Irish hauliers. You talk about the move. I, th I think we will see as a, a continued slower move away from um, um, uh, accompanied to unaccompanied. That has probably been pushed along a bit further by the um, by the the uh, the COVID um, uh, virus. And then lastly, just on sustainability from, from our point of view as an organization, it, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's the next biggest Brexit come COVID. Um, you know, and we, we look at these things as an organization, as the challenge that faces business. Um, and, you know, certainly, and I was, I was speaking at our own national economic dialogue yesterday, and we're not ready for this either as a country or as a, as a group of businesses. Um, and for businesses, what they need to do is break it down into its component parts to get ready. So um, there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done on it and it's coming and it, and it, and it is going to be long lasting. So we, we need to start take action, taking action on that, um, on that now. Um, and some of, the, some of the issues, whether you know, sustainable fuels in um, or the transit in, in shipping is going to take a lot longer than it is in the, um, in the haulage industry, I think. But even the haulage industry, Will be will be further behind where the um, the passenger um, uh, car industry will be. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Simon. Uh, I would just try to go to maybe A uh, just for a, a reaction there on some of what you've heard. You've heard you've heard some very impressive stories of investment of preparedness in the French ports. Um, just to your view on maybe any future changes for you and your industry and your model. Well, um, you know, it's interesting to see how much how much money they've invested in in the ports. Um, speaking from my own perspective, I think we are going to need all the options, um, the volumes that we are looking at doing out of France over the next couple of years. Isn't going to be able to go all on the drag ferry, and. Um, we're definitely, I'd be definitely interested in finding a partner in a customs um, company who can do, who can open up our transits. We can close them ourselves. We, it's, it should be a simple process. As I said, we're doing 250 trucks a week out of the North Sea with an agent in Holland. I can't understand why we can't find someone in France who can do the same thing in partnership with us they open them, we close them. It should be straightforward, should be simple. And then we'll be able to ramp up our French, Irish business in, in, in both directions. Okay, thanks very much, Jay. I think I'll bring just Benoit in on this and maybe this, this, this event wasn't meant to be matchmaking businesses with, with, with solutions in France, but I think Benoit is a, a problem solver, so he may be able to help you. Yes, I discovered this morning the, the problem that was risen by uh, Ahod Emon um, regarding the prices and the, the complexity or, or the process that, that were not uh, that was not uh, totally in line with uh, what could be done uh, somewhere else up north, uh, and, and there is uh, no reason why we should not be able to 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 do altogether the same thing. So 
Um, there is, we talked about competition. Uh, Philip talked about competition. Everybody talks about competition. And that's normal. That's the way business works. And uh, so we've got a lot of uh, customs agents at the port and they're, they're well, they should be ready to provide with the best service or at least what the clients want. So uh, there is no doubt things will move quickly once we know what is desired by the clients, which kind of product they are after. Okay, and maybe I just, Benoit, you might take away that comment as well from Simon about the um, lifting the transit bonds in Calais as well. I think that's an important point raised by, by Irish industry as well. So. Lifting the transit. Maybe Simon, if you want to come in and clarify that. Yeah, the, the issue that, that we've, we've, we've been having with lifting the transit is that where, where you do that is 30 kilometers away from um, the Calais port. It operates restricted opening hours, uh, leading to trucks being delayed and deadlines missed. So what yeah, you... I think it is fair. I think it's not an issue for Benoit directly, but look, I no. think it's good that we, we, we've raised it. The... Several times, it, it's a customs context of where we all are, and 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 I, and I think there is a willingness to do more business with France and the French ports. It is it is an important issue, and it is. I have to say, the twenty percent, actually more than that, twenty five percent of our members transit the move the goods, whether uh, and are the are they are the the port infrastructure, so that the carriers, whether it's the airlines, the shipping companies, or the the hauliers. Or is the port infrastructure, the airports? They're all in, in our group. So it would be remiss of me not to mention this as we are trying to work together to make this better for ourselves. Uh, did I say that diplomatically enough, Laura? <laughs> you did, you did. No, look, I think we've put Benoit on the on the spot here, but look, it's good this is this exchange was to you know share perspectives between Ireland and France. And I think we've heard some amazing stories of, of what the capa capabilities are on the French side. So I think they'll be well able to adapt to our needs and, and to maybe take away some of the ideas today. And, and we, we, we remain in ongoing dialogue with the, with the French authorities in a very positive spirit. So thanks, thanks for that, Simon. And um, perhaps maybe just to go back to John, who opened the discussion for us with that sort of high level presentation of where, where the trade is at. Maybe John, just your, given your knowledge of the Irish economy, and, and how things are going for Ireland at the moment. How do you see any of that affecting our, our trade relations in, in the coming years as we sort of unwind our, our Brexit support? Where, where do you think the Irish economy is going? And we might maybe finish up on that note, hopefully a positive one. <clears throat> I, I think this morning has been it, it, it recorded the very impressive ability of the logistics uh, system to adapt to major changes that it's done it seamless we've heard about the problems today but just looking from outside it is the success in dealing with a completely new regime which is striking i think the next stage is supply chains will and this uh, uh, all the speakers have mentioned it supply chains will adapt now that the logistics can handle different routes and i think it is innovation in the supply chain and the distribution system in particular on, uh, on this island. I think that's where um, uh, firms will deliver change and I would expect to see significant change which will make for a more efficient system within this island. Thank you. Thank you, John. That's a very, uh, very good note to end on. I think we have seen lots of innovation and adaptation over the last few months and probably much more to come. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers really so much for their interventions today. We have now a networking session where I think all of our panelists have registered to take part. So if you haven't booked an appointment and you'd like to book an appointment with them, you can still do that. And I know that they would all be available also to elements of the, the Irish industry and the Irish haulers if they want to follow up these conversations uh, bilaterally afterwards. So maybe just on that, thank you all for your, for your, for your participation today. And I'll hand over just to the ambassador to close our event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, and thank you indeed sincerely to all our panelists and also to all the numerous participants who've been obviously engaged throughout this fascinating discussion. Um, it's certainly from my perspective here at the embassy, what you've been saying has been really, really interesting. It has, um, it will inform our perspective and, um, and deepen our understanding, frankly, of the dynamics 
applicable in these extraordinary circumstances. An awful lot of food for thought uh, and indeed um, information for our future work on the whole range of issues which we've discussed as we've been intensifying our work over the last period uh, in, in the whole area of the north of France. Indeed, Laura and I just returned from Roscoff a few days ago for a two-day very intensive visit where we discussed many of the issues which we've touched on today, as we always do. So thank you very much sincerely, and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you. So thank you.